surprise. Whew, there were moments this week. I did not think this video was going to happen, but here we are. I was doing so good on that Wednesday streak, wasn't I? I'm not going to get into too many details, but I had a case all ready to go. I hit a massive speed bump, completely got derailed, and had to put together a whole new case in pretty much a day. But we're here. I couldn't leave you hanging. I just love you guys too much. And I just, I, I, I don't feel right missing a week. All right, you've waited long enough. Let's get right into the video. Before we do, I have a quick message for you. Before we get started, I want to give a huge thank you to my wonderful friends over at NordVPN for sponsoring another video today. If you've been a longtime supporter, you'll know that NordVPN was my very first sponsor and I'm so thankful for them. Not just for sponsoring me, not just protecting me, but for providing me with what I think is the best part of a VPN. And while protecting your privacy and all of your data across your devices is important, what's also important to me is being able to catch up on shows that I don't get in Canada. For example, the Hulu app. We don't get Hulu in Canada. But with NordVPN and one click of a button, all of a sudden I'm in the United States and I can watch Hulu. It's seriously so easy to use. You know me, zero tech knowledge. And I can fire up my VPN. Fun fact about streaming in NordVPN, there are over 5,300 servers in 60 countries. So if you're wanting to binge streaming services from other countries, you've got 60 to choose from. That is a lot of content. You can also watch across six devices and on every major platform. Whether you use Windows, whether you use Mac, even your Android TV supports NordVPN. And what's really good to remember too is it kind of goes both ways. Maybe you're into traveling a lot and you don't want to lose your shows when you're traveling somewhere. That's happened to us before. So in that instance, whatever country you're into, you just switch it back as if you're just back at home. Log on to your streaming service and there, boom, right back at it. If you want to get streaming and stay protected, use the link in my description or go to nordvpn.com slash Sherilyn for their exclusive offer. Once again, that's nordvpn.com slash Sherilyn. And don't forget, they also have a 30-day money-back guarantee, so your pockets are also protected. Thank you again so much, NordVPN, for sponsoring today's video. Okay, riddle time. I feel like today's riddle is super fitting with the video. I didn't plan it that way, but I'm realizing now it is. It can be cruel, poetic, or blind, but when it's denied, it's your violence you may find. I know I'm gonna regret as soon as I edit this video and I see myself with bangs, like why, why did we do the bangs, Sherilyn? <laughs> They're clip-on, so, you know, just a fun little way to switch things up. I also desperately need to get my roots done, if we're gonna be super honest, and that's a huge factor as well. <laughs> also, I apologize for the mic situation, I've got a new setup here and it's like all up in my face, but I don't have the time to mess with it right now. So today it will be in the video, okay? All right, grab your drinks, grab your snacks, grab your keyboards, your Windex, whatever you need. Maybe you've got a laundry pile waiting. We can do this together, okay? I did wanna give a trigger warning for today's video. It's not based on it being graphic or anything, but if you have uh, experienced abuse growing up or an eating disorder, this may not be the video for you. All right, today we're talking about a case that took place in Glastonbury, Connecticut. I got the vibes that it's a quaint town. In 2020, there were just over 35,000 people there. Fun fact, Noah Webster, creator of Webster's Dictionary, started his teaching career there. I guess the intention for the town for the planners was that it would never be overbuilt. In the 80s, when this story takes place, the majority of the land was undeveloped and there was a lot of heavily wooded areas, lots of parks and state forests. I don't know if it's still like that today. If you're from there, if you visited there, you'll have to let me know. But that's how it was in 1987 and it was also the home to a woman named Joyce Apero. And what happened to Joyce in Glastonbury would leave this small town utterly shaken and also divided on what the meaning of justice is. Joyce is described as a woman that kept most people at a distance. She didn't really let people in and get them to know a personal side to her. Even her very close friends felt like they never had a read on who she really was. They did know she was highly intelligent. She was fun to be around, wasn't afraid to share her opinion, a little bit of a know-it-all, and she was a professional in any subject she dedicated herself to. She worked in the social work and nursing 
nursing home field. Her coworkers described her as a perfectionist, brilliant, extraordinary at her job, and she would not accept anything less of her peers in terms of their dedication as well. So if someone was slacking, Joyce would tell you to pick up your socks. One thing that stood out to people who, you know, were acquaintances to her or thought they knew her was that she was a very dedicated single mother to her 16-year-old daughter named Karen. Karen with an I. Now, Karen's feelings towards her mother are very conflicting. On one hand, her mother is the person who taught her how to cook and bake. She poured in every ounce of time and money that she had into Karen's passion of playing the violin. And on the other hand, she was someone who never showed Karen love or affection. And from her very first memory of her mother until her very last, she was a cruel, abusive, and manipulative woman. The question lies, if that's true, does it make what happened to Joyce Apparel justify. And with that, I forgot my drink. <laughs> kind of whipped myself up a little makeshift sangria here. I know it's a single use straw, but seriously watch Seaspiracy and you'll feel like a lot guiltier about doing other things in the world right now than just drinking from a single use straw that I will probably keep for like the next seven drinks. All right. Joyce was born Joyce Cantone in 1939. She was the youngest child of a large Italian family. She grew up in a cramped apartment with her parents and siblings. Some of her siblings were even adult age when she was born. She said her father was a laborer and a heavy drinker who often abused her mother and the children and eventually died from alcoholism. But this was one version that she told people. Another was that he was a brilliant and sensitive man who was a phenomenal piano player. His dream was to one day be a conductor, but her mother would have none of it. In front of the children, her mother Mother berated him and she was the abusive one. She said that the abuse he suffered became too much and he took his own life. She didn't keep in touch with her mother or her siblings. She would have different stories about them for different people. Most of them though centered around them tormenting her and mocking her for being very intelligent. Joyce's sister's version of things is that Joyce was very pampered as a child. You could tell she was the youngest because everybody catered to her, including her siblings. Joyce was pretty much allowed to do whatever she wanted and even if she did something that broke a rule, she was never really punished for it. The way her older siblings saw it, she was also given opportunities that they really weren't when they were younger just because the family was just in a different financial position and I think, you know, as you have more children, you kind of, you feel like you you know know the ropes a little bit better. But they did feel sorry for Joyce in the sense that she was a really lonely child. Even at a young age, she had this air about her that she was better than everybody in the room. So it didn't really attract kids on the playground to want to be her friend and this kind of led her to live in a world of her own where she created this life that she wanted to and she was very imaginative. For example, one time she told a classmate that a ring that she was wearing was given to her by the Queen of England when her family and her had gone on vacation that spring. It turns out the family had never even been to England. One thing people would give credit for for to Joyce though is the stories she told were very convincing and it seemed like in large part it was because she believed them herself to some capacity. She was intelligent. She did do exceptionally well in school. People who knew her said she had this photographic memory and she could just retain so much information that way and she also knew three or four languages. She received a business major at what is now known as the University of Hartford. When she graduated, it was Hillier College in Hartford. And the majority of her schooling was paid for in scholarships. College is where she met her first husband, a man named Robert White. He proposed while they were still students and then after they graduated, they got married within weeks of graduation. After they got married, Robert went into the work field. He got a job at Good Humored Ice Cream Company and Joyce decided that she wanted to still pursue her education. She ended up taking graduate courses in sociolo sociology. <laughs> sociology at Yale and earned her master's degree in social work and education. The marriage between Joyce and Robert only lasted a little bit less than five years and it's something that Robert wouldn't talk about after it was done. The only thing he would say is that it was a relief when they were apart. Allegedly, he really wanted a family and to have children and she didn't. 
Joyce also had a very alpha personality and so did Robert, so they would often butt heads over who, I guess, wore the pants. After the divorce, when people asked Joyce what had happened, she told them one day she walked into the house and she opened the door and just had this really eerie feeling. And as she walked into the kitchen, she saw blood all over the wallpaper in the kitchen and she looks down and she sees that Robert is dead from a self-inflicted wound. And to this day, she could never have wallpaper in her house. Dude was still alive. Joyce had been the one to move out and got an apartment of her own in East Hartford. And then she quickly got a job working with the state of Connecticut as a social worker for the Department of Child and Youth Services. After her move to Hartford, she meets another man. His name is Michael Perro. He was a deeply religious Catholic and at one point had thought that he would be a priest but ended up taking a position also doing social work. He and Joyce met in 1966. They fell in love. He proposed. She said yes and they were married on July 30th of 1966. Their marriage lasted 10 years but they seemed like quite the mismatch. He was very religious. He even had built a small chapel in their house so that he could go there to pray every day. And Joyce was more into seances, communicating with the beyond, tarot reading. So they didn't really see eye to eye religion wise. And they also didn't see eye to eye when it came to having children. We already know Joyce already didn't have a successful marriage because of him wanting children and that was the same with Michael except for Michael wanted kids even more than Robert did. To Joyce though, she felt like her career was the most important thing in her life and she wanted to keep it that way. Those who knew them as a couple said Joyce definitely ruled the house. So for her saying we're not having children even though she knew Michael really wanted them, that was the way that it was gonna go and it was just something that Michael had kind of accepted. And then in the middle of 1970, Joyce finds out she's pregnant. She is furious. She doesn't want the baby. She accuses Michael of tricking her into getting pregnant somehow. The pregnancy caused a lot of issues in those early days in the house. At one point, Michael did convince Joyce to attend a counseling session with him to see if they could kind of get on the same page, get her excited about things. My understanding was it, it did nothing. It didn't help the situation at all, but he said just one day she kind of came to him and had accepted that she was pregnant and started to look forward to it. On February 12th, 1971, Karen Elizabeth Apparel was born. Michael was over the moon and Joyce not so much. Even after her baby girl was born, she was resentful and considered putting her up for adoption. Joyce's brother even offered to adopt her under the condition that Joyce would have no parental rights and he would be the parent and that would be that. But I guess Joyce wasn't down with that thought. She wanted to give the baby up for adoption, but she wanted the child to know who she was, be referred to as mom, have a say in her entire upbringing. And her brother was like, I just can't agree with that. It's like, you're going to control the narrative, but I'm raising the child. So Joyce and Michael kept Karen. And it wasn't until Karen was about two years old that Joyce finally took some interest in her. It was when Karen could talk and communicate and see that, you know, she was turning into her own little person with this personality. She realizes Karen's this sponge, a sponge she considered highly intelligent and one that she would have a lot of influence over. She had a very unconventional approach to parenting. One day when Joyce's sister was over visiting her little niece, she said that she was down on the floor getting Karen all riled up. She'd tickle her, she'd lift her up and throw her in the air and Karen was just laughing hysterically, having the time of her life. And Joyce just flips out. She's like, that is not the way I'm raising my child. Another time her sister witnessed Joyce slap Karen hard across the face and then she got down in Karen's face and said don't you dare cry and she didn't which is really telling for a toddler to just sit there and not have a reaction it just it broke my heart thinking of any child going through that. Karen says her mom slapped her in the face almost every single day of her life until she was about 12 years old. There were times Karen remembered being even backhanded and sent across the room. I think it's an understatement to say she expected a lot 
from Karen, not just responsibility and respect wise, but also academically. When Karen was in preschool, Joyce would call the school director and ask why she wasn't learning how to read or write yet. Her preschool teachers were also witness to some of the abuse that Karen sustained. One of her teachers saw Joyce backhand Karen because she wasn't getting her jacket on fast enough as they were leaving and runs over and is like, that's very not necessary. And this teacher said like Karen's aunt did that when she knelt down to see if she was okay, she saw that Karen had no reaction. There was no tears, nothing. And then Joyce kind of, I think, snaps into it and realizes they're in public. And she's like, oh my gosh, I, I don't know what's come over me. I'm so stressed out. After they left, this teacher put a call into child services. Unfortunately, nothing was done. It was explained that this was a one-off thing. She felt horribly about it. Karen told the interviewer that came that these things didn't happen. Like I'm sure Joyce told her she had to say. And that's kind of where things were left. Right around this time, Michael and Joyce were getting a divorce. He said it had been a long time coming that he couldn't handle being married to Joyce, but he was trying to stay in the relationship for Karen. But the final straw in the marriage was one evening when he saw Joyce going absolutely crazy on Karen for spilling juice on her shirt. He said she started hitting Karen in front of him and he quickly swept in and pushed Joyce away from Karen. And from this push, Joyce accused him of beating her. And the next day she went to the lawyers to get divorce papers. That was not the version that she gave to family and friends. She said that they got a divorce because he was obsessed with his religion and didn't care about her and Karen. And to Karen, Joyce said that she was the reason that they were getting a divorce. She said if it wasn't for him having a child, he could have pursued his dreams of being a priest and he had too much resentment for Karen. And so he had to leave the family. And when you think about that, that is some really heavy stuff to try to take on when you're only five years old. I just can't imagine the weight of this little girl on her all the time. By the time she started kindergarten, her mom was thinking she's ready to get her, you know, bachelor's degree in like nuclear science or something. I can't even say it. <laughs> nuclear sciences. But like she was doing with the preschool, she would go to the principal's office all the time. And she'd be like, why isn't my child advancing? She's so gifted. And by keeping her in this classroom with these mediocre peasant children, you're damaging her because she's too bored. And she made it very clear to Karen that she was not to associate or play with children, especially children her age. She was not permitted to have any friends because she didn't want Karen associating with anybody who might not be on her in intellectual level. The principals replied to why she was going to stay in the grade that she was, was A, yes, she was very smart, but she wasn't Einstein. He didn't say that to Joyce though. His recommendation was if she's bored, then get her in an activity after school. Since you don't want her mingling with the commoners, maybe put her in something more individual focused like music. Surprisingly, Joyce takes the advice and she enrolls Karen in violin lessons and this becomes both of their lives. Joyce had enrolled her in classes at the Julius Hart School of Music in Hartford and apparently this is one of the most prominent music schools in the area. Music class seemed to be a very beneficial outlet for Karen since she wasn't allowed to get out and play and do anything. This was kind of something that was her own where she could go to her music class and just pour herself in and have it be her thing. Not surprising, Joyce considered Karen, you know, a violin prodigy. And if others didn't see it that way, you'd feel the wrath of Joyce. I read the book Beyond Obsession by Richard Hammer on this case and there is a story in there about what Joyce did at a musical performance one time and I feel like it really brings you in to really understand what people were dealing with with her. So I guess one time there was this performance being put on by the children of the music school and one of the children had a solo and Karen wasn't given a solo, but Joyce was really upset because she felt like, okay, you know, you give the solos to the super gifted ones and Karen should have had a solo. So she was pretty, pretty upset about the whole thing when, you know, ever since she had found out that she wouldn't be having a solo at this thing. So comes the day of the performance, this child performs his solo 
And Joyce stands up and she forces Karen to play the exact same solo. And when she's finished, she looks around the room and she says, see, didn't she do better than the other one? Then she looks at the child and says, see, Karen can play it better than you. I guess this child's parents and Joyce ended up getting into it, exchanging words, swears. Everybody's looking around just being like, is this part of the performance or is, or is this real life? Like, are we on punk right now? Where's Ashton? It's not surprising that she didn't stay long at that music school. After she left there, Joyce hires this prized violinist named Albert Markov to privately teach Karen. He, his wife, and his son were all very gifted violinists. So Karen started taking lessons through the school that he taught at. And then also the, the next day she would do private lessons with him at his house. I guess the two families became very close. It became routine that on Friday nights, Joyce would take the drive from where they were living to where the Markovs were living, which I believe was over an hour away. So there were many weekends that Joyce and Karen would just spend the night or weekend with the Markovs. And this kind of became their thing. And this was a large part of their life. This is what they did every single weekend. Even when Joyce remarried for a third time when Karen was 12, it was known they'd be gone usually Friday and Saturday and you wouldn't see them until Sunday because they had these violin lessons to attend. In terms of this marriage, I guess this new husband, he really adored Karen. He thought she was such a sweetheart, but he had children from a previous marriage and it wasn't one of those cute little blended Brady Bunch family type moments. His children were really unhappy that he was remarried and I guess they tormented Karen. So it got to the point that between what she was experiencing with Joyce, the pressure that she had academically and then dealing with these new step siblings, it became too much for her. And at only 12 years old, she attempted to take her life. This is obviously an extremely loud scream for help. One that might wake up some parents to just maybe reflect on being a little bit of a better support for their child. But when Joyce got to the hospital, she had to be restrained because she was so upset with Karen that she was physically trying to strangle her in front of the nurses and the doctors. After this, child services was called again from the hospital staff. But again, when they interviewed Karen, she said that she and her mom had a great relationship. She considered it probably better than most mothers and daughters relationships. And she was just having a bad day and overreacted and was being dramatic and that her mom also kind of dealt with it the same way but it was only just because she was scared because she didn't want something to happen to Karen. So again the the file was closed and it was just left at that and then not long after that incident Joyce's third husband filed for divorce and Joyce and Karen ended up getting a townhouse on a street called Butternut Drive. Karen said at this point in their relationship the abuse went from being quite physical all the time to very mental and emotionally abusive. One of the hardest things for her to deal with around this time that really stood out was this was around the time that she first started developing an eating disorder and she said that it started because Joyce would constantly call her fat and ugly. She would make her diet and over exercise. She was always exercising. And then when she would eat a meal, she'd make Karen go upstairs and throw it up. To take it even further, and what I just saw is diabolical almost, was she would buy chocolate eclairs and she would have them like, you know, the first thing that you see when you open up the fridge and she'd make Karen eat them and then persist to call her fat. All of this had changed for Karen when she turned 16 years old and she gets a call on August 5th, 1987 saying that her mother didn't show up to work. We know when it came to work, Joyce was very reliable. So this is unusual, but some of her close friends at work thought, there was a possibility that she had just forgot to communicate with them, that she was coming in later because I guess six weeks prior she had been in a pretty bad car accident and she was seeing a chiropractor and they knew she had an appointment with the chiropractor at 10 a.m. that day. So they thought, okay, maybe she just went from home to the chiropractor and she's just gonna come to work later. So a little after 10, they decide to kind of go stalker mode and call the doctor's office to see if she showed up there. And the receptionist says, no, she 
didn't come to her appointment. At the same time that her friend is finding this out, the police over in Massachusetts are getting a call that a 1986 white Volkswagen Jetta has just been found down this slope and it's kind of half submerged in this stream. They had to take the VIN number to the Volkswagen dealership to try to figure out who the owner was though because the license plate had been removed and there was no identifying papers inside like no insurance or registration. So they take it to the dealership and I mean for 1987 it sounds like they were you know pretty well equipped and organized and had some nice techie things going on because they were able to go in their system and find out that yes this vehicle had been leased to a company called Athena Healthcare Associates and that's where Joyce was working. So they call Athena and it's actually her friend who's trying to track her down that answers and they say do you recognize the description of this vehicle? And he says, yeah, it actually sounds like my friend Joyce and she's currently missing. So they get Joyce's address. They go to the townhouse. Nobody answers. I guess several hours later, they decide to go back again and try. And this time they try the front door and the front door was open. So they let themselves in and they're looking around and nothing is really standing out to them. When they get to the bedroom though, it does look like the bed has been pulled away from the wall and kind of on the side a little bit and there's no bedding on it there's pillows and all of the the blankets are on the ground but they're like okay well maybe this is just how they sleep there's also an empty garbage bag box on the floor but besides those two things it looked tip top shape in there. After talking with Joyce's friend, they find out that she's the single mom and has a 16 year old daughter. And at the time, Karen was actually staying at the Markov's house and Joyce had told this friend that. So they're able to track Karen down at the Markov's and they ask her if she's re recently spoke to her mother. She said the last she spoke to her mother was the afternoon before when Joyce called her just to let her know that she had made it from the Markov's to their house. I guess the two of them had spent the weekend at the Markovs together and they went to Albert's son's violin concert. He was a young guy named Alex. And when Joyce needed to head back, they just made the decision that Karen would stay until that weekend when her next lesson was coming up and then Joyce would bring her back home. They let Karen know that they've found her vehicle and it's looking like it's under pretty suspicious circumstances and they think it's the best idea if she can come back to the city and meet with them at the station. I guess Karen wasn't really sure how to process. The Markov said she was worried about where she was gonna stay, what was gonna happen to her. So she hangs up with the police and she immediately calls her boyfriend that she had been seeing for about a year. He was a 19 year old guy named Dennis Coleman. Even though he was a few years older than Karen, he's described as the kind of kid you would want your daughter to bring home. He was born on February 23rd, 1968 to high school sweethearts Dennis Sr. and Carol followed by his baby brother Matthew. Dennis seemed to have a typical upbringing nothing like Karen's. When he was five his parents divorced but nothing really besides that was a struggle. He was well liked in school, he was very athletic and his peers looked up to him. I guess when his mom remarried and they moved he changed schools at some point in junior high so he did go from kind of being you know the, the kid everyone liked to to hang out with and he was a little jockey so people liked his accomplishments and then when he changed schools and you know it's junior high those are rough days he now found himself at the bottom of the barrel it was a bit of a blow to his ego i got the sense that he was kind of the hopeless romantic type even at a young age he really held on to you know his junior high girlfriends and his high school girlfriends and when those relationships would end he he was pretty broken up about it maybe a bit of a stage five clinger I'm not judging he and Karen ended up meeting on a night in May 1986 I guess Joyce and Karen had just come home from a violin performance that they had gone to watch and as they pulled into the driveway and Joyce turned off the car she went to roll up her window but like the, the handle mechanism wasn't working and Dennis lived in the same complex as them he was in unit eight and Karen and her mom were in unit three so Joyce is kind of looking around seeing if anyone's around and they spot Dennis and she just says to Karen can you please go ask that kid over there if he can come and figure out what's going on over here because he was actually working on his car outside so she figured he, he's got to know what he's doing Karen goes over introduces herself asks if he thinks he can come over and fix it and he says yes and then after he did, I guess Karen just stayed out all night on the driveway talking with him. And from that evening, they spent all of their time together and fell for each other very fast. This was in the good old day of writing notes. 
So they would write notes back to each other and just leave them on each other's windowsills every day. Since he was older and had a car, he was able to pick her up and drop her off at school. It sounds like they just did the usual thing in those days, hung out in the neighborhood together, just go for aimless drives. They also shared a passion for music, one of Dennis's aspirations. Holy cow, I just spat so much. <laughs> What? One of his aspirations in life was to be a very famous and successful rock star. He thought, you know, if he could find a band and they could make it big and work really hard for a few years, him and Karen would be set for life. It was a month into their courtship that he knew he wanted to marry Karen and he asks her to marry him with like a little paper ring and Karen says yes, but they both know that obviously Joyce needs to approve. And he kind of lucks out when Joyce's car breaks down and he offers to be the one to drive her to work and Karen to school. So he's doing this every day and she just thinks he's a, a respectable young guy so she supports the relationship. As Karen and Dennis's relationship grew, she started to open up to him about the abuse that she suffered from her mom. One of the things she shared with him was that because of the abuse, she had attempted to take her life at one point and it was always in the back of her mind that her mom would just push her to that point again and that one day soon he might lose her because she wouldn't be able to take it anymore. Then soon the conversation shifted from I want to take my life to I think you should take hers and then I'm good to stay here. And once she said that out loud it seemed that almost every single conversation that they had, every letter that they went back and forth with. It would involve Karen saying how much she wanted to have a life with him, but the only way that they could have a future and the only way he could prove that he loved her would be to kill her mother. And like I said, it seemed like he was this hopeless romantic type and I think you know being the hero of somebody's story was very appealing to Dennis. He wasn't a killer though and as much as he loved her and wanted to be with her and was desperate for her love and approval, he wasn't going to just be like, okay, sure, when? So he would try to give suggestions. He'd say, why don't we run away together? I'll go with you. And Karen would say, no, that wouldn't work. She'll find us. He even told his dad about the abuse that Karen was dealing with and his dad offered to adopt Karen if he wanted. And, and he goes to Karen says it and she's like, no, you know, then your family's in danger because she's not going to just let me go. She also says that it's beneficial if she's no longer here because she's entitled to about $300,000 in life insurance when Joyce dies. Again, Dennis doesn't care. He's not down. He's like, you know, I've got this whole rock star career going where we're going to be fine. Allegedly, when she sees that she's not really getting anywhere with Dennis, she tries to just do it herself by taking Joyce's sleeping medication and crushing it up and putting it in a sandwich for her. But Joyce only ended up taking one bite and she thought that the relish had gone bad because it tasted so bad, so she threw it out. So then she went back to Dennis, and this this kind of went on for months where she was begging him, putting the pressure on, and he's just trying to deflect and find solutions for her, and it's not working. But he's also, I want to say, maybe desperate for her love. Almost every letter he wrote, he would repeatedly say, please, please don't leave me. Please don't leave me. What can I do? Please don't leave me. I love you. And she would just kind of be like, well, if you love me, you know what to do. And it eventually got to the point where he caved and he said, okay, I'll do this for you. And they had this big plan that was set. But as the day was approaching, both of them decided that they couldn't really go through with it and so they didn't and that kind of also shifted their relationship a little bit they went on a break and they didn't see each other for about six months during this time Dennis's family had moved off Butternut Drive and Karen started spending more time at the Markov house and as she's spending more time there she starts to develop feelings for her instructor's son named Alex pretty sure I already said that before mm -hmm. I guess Karen tells Joyce about her interest in Alex and she's super supportive of this. She really wanted Karen to marry successful. And with his talents in the music world, she was like definitely pushing that relationship. And so she started letting Karen pretty much stay there as long as the Markovs would let her. And that's why she had been there past her lessons when Joyce had gone missing. Kind of sounds like Karen had herself in a bit of a, a, 
a struggle. She had ended things with Dennis, but they were still communicating and she was kind of keeping him on the back burner, I think, still telling him that she wanted to be with him and that she loved him. And she'd kind of go back and forth between the two. She liked the idea of being with Alex for the clout, but she knew that Dennis would do anything in the world for her. And that's how things were when Joyce was missing. They were kind of all up in the air between her and Alex and her and Dennis. So as Karen is making her way from the Markov house to the police station to help try to find her mother, an 11-year-old boy is taking his little dog for a walk in an area called Bald Mountain Road. And as they're walking by this slope, the dog starts freaking out and he's pulling the little boy to go down and the boy's just kind of like, okay, well, I'm just gonna roll with this and go on an adventure. And so the dog's leading the way and as they get to the bottom of this hill, he can see what definitely looks like a body. And so he runs up and he goes to get his stepdad to get help. The police arrive and they confirm, yes, this little boy just found a body. It looked like a woman that was maybe in her 40s and she's like half concealed with leaves. They just kind of look like they were like tossed on her quickly and she's wearing a nightgown. It's also clear that she suffered a gruesome attack. She's just covered head to toe in bruises and it appeared she was strangled and possibly suffocated because there was still nylon around her neck and she had like paper towel in her mouth. Like I said before, this town is very small, quaint, word travels fast. So there's quickly a connection that an abandoned car was found earlier on and now a body and they're only a mile and a half apart. So they're assuming that it's, it's Joyce. By the time they were able to confirm that yes, in fact, it was Joyce Aparo, Karen had gotten a ride to the station from her violin instructor and they inform her they found her mother and that she's no longer alive. And I guess Karen's reaction was just kind of stunned. She just froze. As she's kind of processing, she asks if she's able to make a phone call. And so she's placed in this room where one of the clerks at the station was doing some work and she starts kind of eavesdropping on the call. At first, Karen's talking normal. She's like, hi, yeah, I, I'm at the police station. And then it goes into a little bit of a whisper, but she's able to piece it together. And she hears Karen say things like, that's okay, you, you were there at the house the night before we left anyways. Don't worry about it. Oh, the police said the place looked neat. Did you clean up? Did you make the bed? The police think it's a cat burglar. Don't worry about it. Turns out Karen was on the phone with Dennis and it's bizarre that she even made a phone call to him in the police station to begin with because as soon as she left the station, she went to his house. After she leaves, this clerk is still kind of trying to process what was going on it is if she was overthinking it she's kind of like surely if you had something suspicious to say you wouldn't do it here but she couldn't shake it and she felt like she just needed to bring it up so she goes to one of the detectives and says what she kind of overheard and they go straight to dennis's house knock on the door they say seems like you know there was a little conversation that we weren't privy to and we'd like to get a little bit more of context on. So they take them both back to the station to be interviewed and they ask Dennis where where he was the night before. Dennis said he was with some good friends. They watched a couple movies, had some beer. He went home at about 11.30 and went to bed because he had to get up early at about 7 a.m. to work his shift at the local country club. When it came to that conversation between him and Karen, he said it was just an innocent conversation that was taken the wrong way. He said that Karen and Joyce had asked him to feed the cats while they were away. And when Karen asked on the phone, have you done it? He was referring to feeding the cats. Dennis seemed to have a pretty solid alibi. Joyce was found in an area called Bernardston. I'm probably saying that wrong. I'm sorry. And it was quite the trek from there to Glastonbury. And there was no way that he would have been able to do that and be at work at on time at 7 a.m. that next day. So they let him leave. Then two days after Joyce had died, the police come to the house to talk to Karen. They were just doing, you know, the typical questions, asking what her mom's daily patterns were. Did she have any enemies who might want to hurt her? She's not really giving them any information, but they notice she's fidgeting with this piece of paper. And at one point she gets up and she tries to throw it out in the garbage. And one of the detectives goes and grabs it out of the garbage, reads it, and it's a letter from Dennis. And it's just as questionable as the conversation they had on the phone. The letter said, to my dream girl, 
I will do the deed. I promise you. How was your trip? Okay, I hope. I miss you horribly. Come back soon. Listen, I've got a plan for this week. Almost all the details are set. We must seriously talk. It could work. I can't wait to talk to you. Do you still love me? I hope you do. I love you more than ever. Please don't ever leave me. I see good times for us in the near future. We'll have fun. So now they're like, what what does do the deed mean? And she said that Dennis had been having problems with his stomach and they thought that maybe it was an ulcer. So she was being a little bit persistent on him to go to the doctor because he wasn't wanting to. So this was him saying that he was he was finally going to go check it out and go see a doctor. At this point, things keep, you know, flashing back to Dennis. So they go to talk to his friends that he said that he was hanging out with that evening. Their names are Chris Wheatley and his girlfriend, Kira Lintner. They speak to the police and say pretty much the same story that Dennis said. They hung out that evening. They watched three horror movies. They had some beers and Dennis left around 1130 because he said he had to get up early to go to work. The day after that was the funeral for Joyce and after the funeral, Dennis comes to one of Karen's friend's houses where she was staying. I guess they excuse themselves and they go to the bathroom to have a conversation and then they come back into the living room and when they do, Karen looks at one of Joyce's good friends who was there and asks if she can speak to them in private outside. When they go outside, she says she needs help and that Dennis just took her into the bathroom to confess to her that he killed her mother. So they go to the police. She tells them everything Dennis just said and she had details that nobody would know unless they heard it from the killer or they were the killer, like her having this paper towel in her mouth because they never released that to the public. They immediately arrest Dennis, but he's not giving them any information. He doesn't wanna communicate or talk, but they're able to get a warrant and go to his house and there they find this huge stack of letters that gives them everything they need and more. In the letters, they were mostly between him and Karen and Karen went from being an innocent daughter whose crazy obsessed boyfriend killed her mother so that they could be together to full-blown participant in her murder. Also in the stack was a letter from his good friend who they had already questioned, Chris Whitley. And there was a line in one of his letters that really stood out to the detectives and it said, so dude, how's your woman? Is her mother still alive? One thing that was really bothering the detectives of tying Dennis to this crime was that they're trying to figure out this timeline and that he couldn't have done it alone because he couldn't have just walked from where her car was abandoned. So a couple days after, fingerprints were pulled from Joyce's Jetta and they belonged to Chris. So now they know that Chris had helped and he followed Dennis while he abandoned the vehicle and he's the one who drove him back. Since Chris and Kira had admitted that they were together all night, they were both arrested and both charged with conspiracy to commit murder and accessory to murder. At this point, they really wanted to arrest Karen as well, but they didn't have anything and no one was coming forward. Then on August 27th, Karen's best friend Shannon comes to the police station with her parents and her lawyer and says she has some information to share with them about a secret that Karen shared with her and she just couldn't keep it anymore. I guess an immunity deal was put together and Shannon confessed that Karen had told her that Dennis had killed her mom and she had known since the day that Karen came back home. And she even showed Shannon Joyce's purse that was in Dennis's bedroom and inside her mom's purse was her ID. So that was all they needed. The next day, Karen was arrested and the town lost it. She just looked like, you know, the girl next door. She's this accomplished violinist. There's just, there's just no way. And up until this point, Dennis still wasn't talking. And the police knew they needed something more concrete instead of just Shannon's story because she could be making it up. So at first they try to tell him that it's Karen that initially came to the police station and turned him in, but he thought they were plotting against them, trying to get in between them. He wouldn't budge. It wasn't until they showed him her diary that they found at her house where he realized he was being played. She had pretty much wrote in there that she had Dennis wrapped around her finger and that as soon as her mom was taken care of that would, you know, leave this open door for her to be with Alex. The police show Dennis at this point Karen's statement which says Dennis did this on his own and he did this as a act of desperation so the two of them could get back get back together. And Dennis's story was that for the week leading up to the murder, 
Karen was putting more pressure on him than she ever had before. And since things were very rocky with them, she was implying that, you know, once this got done, everything was gonna be perfect with them again. Dennis took full responsibility for being the one that took Joyce's life. He only contacted Chris to follow him from the house after he had killed Joyce, dispose of the vehicle, and then bring Dennis back to his house. Dennis said he prepared by stopping at a convenience store and grabbing pantyhose. He also purchased a black wig and a big box of garbage bags. He dressed in all black clothing. Chris and his girlfriend Kira picked him up from his house and dropped him off outside of Joyce and Karen's house. He let himself in with his key that he had. He said Joyce was sleeping and as he entered the bedroom and was walking closer to her, she heard something got startled, shot out of bed. And he said at that point, there was no turning back. He just jumped on the bed and strangled her. I guess he tried to put her in a garbage bag and then drag her so that it was easier to put her in her vehicle, but the garbage bags kept ripping. So he just picked her up, put her in her vehicle. Chris and Kira followed him while he brought her body to this secluded area where there was this like slope and hill, threw some leaves on her to try to conceal her. Then he got back in the car, drove up a little more, and ditched the car about a mile away. According to Kira and Chris, the whole way home, Dennis was inconsolable. He was just crying. He said he had to do it. He tried to find other ways. There was no other way. Karen made him do it. Now, although Chris and Kira admitted to participating in helping Dennis dispose of Joyce and the vehicle, Chris's family was very well off. He was a pre-med student at the time, actually, and his family hired them a very high-profile lawyer, and this lawyer was able to cut a deal. They agreed to be witnesses at the trial and share all of the information that they knew, and in exchange, they couldn't be charged and nothing they shared could be used in the future. So the state's attorney agreed, and the two of them only received probation for a hindering prosecution charge. I guess this deal really enraged the public because they basically shared information that the police already gathered from Dennis. They also had letters that implicated Chris of, you know, being aware at one point prior to all of this happening that Karen was telling Dennis that, she didn't want her mom around anymore and he had told him about it. So the public's perception was, you know, Chris had no emotional ties to Karen to be jaded and manipulated and he could have potentially saved Joyce's life had he gone to the police with the information that he knew beforehand. Dennis's lawyer worked out a deal where if he cooperated and testified against Karen, the maximum sentence would not be an option. At the time, it would have been 80 years, so he takes the deal, he pleads guilty, and he was sentenced to 34 years in jail. Karen went on trial, and she pleaded not guilty, and her lawyer argued that Karen was a victim of very well-documented physical and psychological abuse at the hands of her mother, and that she wasn't in her right mind. The jury ended up deliberating for nine days, and as the foreman came out of deliberations, he looked at Karen, gave her a wink, and declared her not guilty on the accessory to murder charge. I guess they deadlocked on the conspiracy charge, and no charges were ever brought forward after that. So Karen only spent three days in prison. She moved out of state, she moved on with her life, she got married and had children. And after serving 22 years in prison, Dennis was also released. And so, yeah, I, I couldn't even begin to try to tell you the amount of times I've gone back and forth with how I feel about this. I've seriously been waking up and I have dreamt about it at night and been like, this case has not left me even when I'm sleeping. It's tough because this person did such awful, horrible things to you your whole entire life, but it's never the answer to take their life. And it's almost like when you are being raised through abuse and manipulation and control, that without a doubt is going, going to have a serious effect on you. And then that hereditary mental illness that this person has, and then the abuse that they're showing you, it kind of manifests itself into the victim. You know, the town was really affected by this and they were separated because there were the people who felt like what she had gone through was justified because she didn't feel like she had any other answers where others, you know, had the the reaction of, okay, but a lot of people grow up in this situation and then they don't 
kill their parents for it. And I don't know why, but I couldn't help but go back to Gypsy Rose throughout this story. They're not similar cases, but this the manipulation and the control between this mother and daughter and just how unhealthy it is and how abusive and how damaging it is to that child who is growing up with no healthier positive examples. I don't know. I don't know. I, I've, I've been a disaster. You guys have to let me know where your thoughts are. Was I the only one who went to Gypsy? All right, that is it for me today. If you haven't already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. You already know it means the world to me. You mean the world to me. I love and I appreciate you so, so much. The answer to today's riddle is it can be cruel, poetic, or blind, but when it's denied, it's your violence you may find. And the answer is justice, which still I'm like, was it justice? Where's the justice? I don't know. I gotta go. I'll see you in the next video. I will miss you terribly. Until then, make sure to love each other. Love yourself and I'll see you soon.